from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today's event is uh, sponsored by Science, Technology, and Business Division here at the Library of Congress. I'm Tomoko Steen. I'm research specialist here at the library. And uh, this is one of the science literacy series. And um, today's topic is uh, molecular anthropology. Is it molecular? And genetics? <laughs> anthropology? Genetics. genetics. Um, today's speaker, Dr. Adam Wilkins, uh, he's a geneticist and author. He has uh, uh, authored of several books previously, and uh, he has been uh, trained as a geneticist, especially microbiome genetics, and uh, he has worked on the field of science, but he turned himself into the more science writing and uh, public outreach. Uh, he has been the editor of the bio essay, uh, broadly read uh, journal, as well as now he is the editor of the perspective section of the uh, genetics, which is the probably leading journal for the field of genetics. And um, Dr. Wilkins have done PhD at the uh, University of Washington and so he was born in uh, Columbus, Ohio, but currently he is at Humboldt University. So a lot of people ask me, oh, is he a German? Uh, actually, he is American, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but um, um, it's going to be an interesting talk, and uh, we have a book outside. So after this, we have a book signing. So if you are interested, take a look at the book as well. And. Um, before further ado, maybe we just invite speaker, uh, Dr. Wilkins. Uh, Tomoko, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and uh, even more, I'd like to thank you and the Library of Congress for inviting me to come speak. Uh, it really is an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, the Library of Congress is uh, a bastion of uh, American civilization and as such a defender of uh, fundamental American values, and those uh, need uh, defense as much uh, today as, as they have it uh, at any other time. Uh, so my topic is indeed uh, the evolution of the human face, or if we were to put it in terms that Rudyard Kipling might like, uh, how our species acquired its face. Um, as background to, before I get into the subject itself, I'd just like to say a little bit about how I got interested in it. As Tomoka said, my background is in other things, particularly microbial genetics, but I've always been interested in evolution. Um, and I think it's uh, safe to say that for most of the 20th century, um, evolutionary biology had a very uh, self-consistent, uh, reasonable, logical theory. Uh, but there's a real lack of uh, specificity to how much one could say about specific evolutionary uh, changes uh, for which there was evidence, but uh, we could not tie specific uh, genes and genetic factors to uh, particular evolutionary changes. So in a way it was a kind of, it was a good theory, but it lacked a certain kind of rigor. Um, and begin, but beginning in the 1970s and, and acquiring strength in the 1980s, uh, it began to be possible to isolate genes uh, specifically and make very specific hypotheses about uh, what uh, particular genes were doing in evolution, not least in uh, how particular genes were responsible uh, for particular traits in different organisms. Uh, and for uh, somebody interested in evolutionary biology, this is the prospect of scientific heaven, to be able to really have uh, good uh, concrete ideas about what genes might be involved in uh, evolutionary changes of particular kinds. So I wasn't involved uh, as a uh, laboratory scientist in this work, but I was very interested in it, and I wrote commentaries. Uh, and I finally wrote a book that summed up the state of the field, which came out in 2002. Uh, and shortly uh, after uh, the book became published, I found myself thinking, well, how uh, might this kind of thinking apply to human evolution? We are uh, a distinctive looking uh, animal species. Uh, we are animals, of course. We're a lot more. Uh, our species is unique in, in what it does in the world and what it has done. Um, 
but uh, surely uh, there would be a scope, I felt, for this uh, new branch of evolutionary biology called evolutionary developmental biology uh, to say something uh, interesting about uh, humans and human evolution. And uh, shortly after having this thought, I, I felt, ah, the human face might be a particularly interesting aspect of, of human uh, characteristics of human biology to focus on. It was m more just a hunch and a feeling uh, because at the time actually there was very little one could say about uh, the genes that are involved in, in constructing the human face uh, and, and that might be involved in the, in the evolutionary series that uh, gave rise to, to our species and our particular kind of face. Um, for various reasons, I couldn't start on the book right away, um, having to do with work and other projects. Um, and I didn't really start on it in a serious way until 2011. And it was a good thing that I waited because, in a sense, uh, there was very little known when I first had the idea. By the time I got started on the book, uh, there was a great deal more information. So, in effect, the field had caught up with my ambitions to write about it, uh, which was nice. Um, okay, so uh, let us. Uh, but I'll just add one more thing, and that is that, uh, in, in a sense, as I uh, worked on the book, I found the focus of my interest uh, changing somewhat uh, from that of uh, how the genes are, uh, that are involved in making the human face, how they'd evolved and how their expression characteristics had changed, more to the, uh, the why of, of this. What was it in our evolutionary history, the evolution of our species, uh, that uh, really has made us the species we are. So while my uh, official title for this talk is Making Faces, the Evolutionary Origins of the Human Face, the alternative title gives more of a hint as to uh, what I'm going to focus on, how our, how our evolving face helped make us human. Okay, so let us begin uh, with a basic question. What precisely do we mean by the face? Now we all recognize faces, and even in this sort of caricature uh, form, uh, that is clearly a face, but how do we define the face? It's always good to start with a clear definition of, of one subject. And briefly, uh, the face is the forward directed part of the animal's head uh, with the mouth and three kinds of sense organs for vision, smell, and taste. Uh, forward uh, directed means uh, the face uh, is set in the direction of movement uh, of, of, uh, the animals, uh, of the animal. Uh, so our, our faces uh, do indeed uh, look forward uh, toward the environment that the animal is entering. Uh, and what I have here is uh, pictures of uh, representative vertebrates. So uh, we are in the group of animals termed the vertebrates, which are uh, a subdivision of a major group called the chordata. We needn't go into uh, those details very much. Uh, but the vertebrates, all the animals with backbones, uh, consist of about 50,000 species, which is roughly a half to 1% of all the uh, estimated existing animal species in the world. Still 50,000 is, is a big number, and all vertebrates have faces, as you can see here. Um, we cannot see the uh, sense organs uh, very directly uh, in this, but of course you can, well, except for the eyes. Um, so uh, what we have here is uh, a fish, uh, an amphibian, a reptile, bird, and two of my favorite mammalian species, wolves and us. Uh, and they all have eyes and uh, some sort of uh, uh, visible nostrils for olfaction. We can't see the uh, organs of taste because they're within the mouth. Um, so another way of uh, putting this is to say that uh, the face is the sensory headquarters of the animal. Okay, it's a really concentrated area of the animal's body uh, that has uh, three of the main uh, sense or uh, kinds of sense organs, uh, with of course the uh, organs of hearing just behind the face, uh, and they are in close association with the mouth. Now, why uh, why uh, why is the face constructed in this way? Well, we get a clue from considering. Uh, the evidence that we have on the earliest vertebrates, which were uh, tiny fish, and they did indeed have, uh, from everything we know, of course we don't know directly about their organs of uh, taste and olfaction, uh, but they had two eyes in association with the mouth. Uh, and this was, must have been for them a tremendous uh, uh, aid to, uh, uh, having, uh, to being able to find food and to ingest it. To have the, uh, the eyes and the uh, organs of olfaction near the mouth uh, helps the animal, of course, to find uh, food. If you imagine the eyes and, and, and the organs of olfaction back here, 
you can see that they wouldn't be nearly as useful to the animal for finding food as if they're in close association with the mouth. So let's, uh, having uh, defined the face, let's uh, come to the question of what makes the human face particularly worth talking about. Is it just because it's the face of our species? Uh, quite naturally, we are interested in things that relate directly to us, just as uh, most of us are more interested in our uh, family and friends than people down the block whom we might see almost every day but whom we don't know anything about. So or, or is the face uh, primarily interesting just because it is our face? Or is it, in fact, something uh, a rather special and unusual face? And I'm going to uh, uh, argue briefly that it is indeed a very special and interesting face. Uh, so to answer this, this question, if you're going to argue that something's special, it's got to be special in comparison to something else. And so I'm, uh, we, you need to compare it, in this case, with other faces. Uh, and let's just focus on the mammals, which is our uh, major subgroup within the vertebrates. So uh, first of all, let me just admit that there are some very interesting, unusual, indeed special uh, faces amongst the mammals, and we have an assortment of these here. Uh, no need to uh, go into details. You can see immediately that they're not like your cat or your dog, uh, which are more typical mammals. But the great majority of mammals actually do have a kind of typical generic face. Uh, there are 18 divisions within the mammals called orders. Okay, uh, It's a taxonomic term. Uh, and I've shown here uh, typical uh, members of eight different uh, orders of mammals. Uh, and if I uh, picked examples from most of the other orders of mammals, uh, uh, it would be a similar picture. Uh, the features that uh, the typical mammal has are a muzzle, okay, uh, rather well-spaced eyes, fur on the face, you can see that in all of these, uh, and uh, no real forehead. The, the head sort of slopes back gently from just above the eyes. And those are the features that make uh, for uh, a commonality in the faces of most mammals. And once one has realized that, one sees that, in fact, even amongst some of the oddballs that I showed earlier, uh, some of them have at least one or two of, of those common features. Uh, and without going into the details, I'll just uh, you know, make that point. But having, having accepted the fact that there is this set of common features, uh, we then uh, uh, come to the rather surprising fact that one of the most unusual mammalian faces is that of Homo sapiens. That's ourselves, okay? Uh, and since uh, most of us in this room tend to think of the human face as the prototypical, hence normal uh, face, it's maybe a surprise to think that we actually have a very odd and different animal face. So instead of just uh, you're t taking my word for, for the, uh, this claim that our face is particularly unusual. I decided to quote an authority here, a man named Donald Enlow. Uh, I'm not sure if he's uh, still alive, uh, but he uh, is or was uh, one of the great experts on craniofacial, uh, uh, the craniofacial skeleton. In other words, the skull and, and the bones of the face. And here I'll just read out, even though you can read it, I'll read it out. Uh, the human face is different. By ordinary mammalian standards, our facial features are unusual, specialized, and perhaps even grotesque. The long functional muzzle that marks the face of most other mammalian forms is all but lacking in man. The associated snout is reduced to a curious overhanging vestige, known as our nose. Uh, the face is wide, flat, and vertically disposed. Okay, We have these flat and indeed vertically disposed faces. Instead of a graceful facial contour sloping back to the skull roof, the human uh, face uh, possesses a unique bulbous upright forehead in front of an enormous brain case. The flattened face is uh, diminutive in character relative to the remainder of the enlarged head. So our faces are small relative to that of, of most other mammals. The eyes are close together and they face straight forward. The human dental arches are disproportionately small relative to the size of the whole body. In other words, we have smaller teeth. Okay, so, but, uh, so we, indeed, uh, the physical features of our face are unusual, uh, and for an evolutionary biologist, that's interesting. Uh, but what makes the human face truly unusual is not its structure, but its behavior, and specifically its capacity for different expressions, uh, as illustrated here. Okay, now there are uh, altogether seven basic strong human expressions, and uh, uh, one is neutral, okay, where you're not showing any particular emotion. Anger, disgust, fear, happiness, uh, sadness, and surprise, uh, shown in that order here. Uh, 
the the lines under uh, these uh, line drawings indicate the tension lines from the muscles in the face that uh, create these expressions. And I'll have a bit more to say about the muscles, uh, the facial muscles, in a moment. So uh, most uh, mammals uh, do not have this uh, great range of expressions of strong expressions, and certainly uh, the other vertebrates, fish, amphibians, uh, reptiles, birds, uh, do not have uh, anywhere near this. Uh, and I'll come back to the why of that in a moment. But uh, some of our nearest, uh, and I'm tempted to say dearest, uh, relatives, uh, the great apes, in fact, uh, do have uh, a, a large expressive capacity, as shown here in this comparison. Uh, and uh, you can uh, make really a very good judgment that uh, the strong expressions they show, which can often be likened to particular human expressions accompanying certain motion, uh, emotions, uh, really reflect those emotions because of the context. Uh, the chimpanzee happiness expression occurs when the animal is really uh, showing some pleasure in, in the animals it's interacting with or, or whatever. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's not pure anthropomorphism uh, by a long shot. But, what, uh, but uh, these very expressive animals, chimps, uh, bonobos, gorillas a little bit less, uh, orangutans a little bit less, but these very expressive, facially expressive animals uh, don't have quite the full range of expressions that we do. Uh, and this is just a small illustration of uh, more subtle expressions that our species uh, exhibits. Uh, and uh, one of the nice things is that almost everybody in this audience, uh, in fact, I'm sure everybody in this audience, uh, can read these expressions and understand something of the emotions that uh, this person uh, is, is experiencing and displaying in each of these uh, situations. Uh, and altogether, there are something like, uh, I don't know the precise number, uh, there are people who study this, this is a whole large area of research, there's something like 50 of these so-called uh, minor expressions. Um, and that's a great number. So I'm now going to make uh, the claim that we are the most facially expressive animal on Earth. Uh, okay, and I stress facially because uh, other animals really have different ways of expressing their feelings uh, through, uh, through uh, body language, uh, 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 that is, uh, body language below the head, uh, uh, through, uh, through sound. Uh, and other ways, but facially we are the most expressive animal on earth. And I say that not only because of this great range of expressions we have that uh, our uh, nearest animal cousins don't have, and there are scientific ways to, to measure this, I should add. Uh, it's a, a method called FACTS, uh, um, which we need not go into in detail here, but by using FACTS you can actually look at the expressions in other animals, and this has been done with, with chimpanzees and dogs, and they really do uh, by, by these measurements, by this technique, uh, they really are less expressive than we are in the range of what they do. But in addition, the frequency of our expressions, uh, I think we are probably the most expressive animal on Earth because we are talking animals. And when we talk uh, there is, uh, to each other, uh, there is a play of expressions on our face. And if you watch any two people uh, having a conversation for a any length of time, more than just hello, goodbye, uh, you will see this play of expressions as a kind of shadow dialogue. And even if you can't hear the words, you can tell something about uh, the feelings that are being expressed uh, accompanying the words. Uh, so uh, this raises an, in an interesting evolutionary question. How did we become this uh, super expressive uh, animal using our faces? Um, so uh, the basic biological foundation of this uh, is a whole set of muscles called the mimetic muscles. Uh, and uh, these are diagrammed here, and uh, again, we need not go into the details. The key point is that uh, the mimetic muscles are found only in the mammals, and that's why uh, the other vertebrates aren't near as expressive. They don't have the capacity uh, to move their skin uh, in the, on their faces in the way that we mammals do uh, with these mimetic muscles. Uh, the face is the only place on the mammal's body where there is a direct connection to the skin for moving the skin, okay? And it's a mammalian specialty. Uh, now, other mammals have these, uh, have many of these muscles. Uh, many uh, of the um, many of the animals, uh, mammals that are not primates, don't have the full set. But our nearest relatives do have the full set: the gorillas and the chimpanzees. So the fact that they are perhaps somewhat less facially expressive is not due to a difference in the muscles, but it must be due to either uh, the, the way the muscles are innervated or the mental processes that, uh, that activate the expressions. 
Uh, and I think it's the latter, though uh, in this lecture I won't have, uh, be able to document this, just as I won't be able to document many of the things that I say, uh, but I go into them in the book. Um, and of course we'll be glad to take questions on, on that at the end. Um, so uh, having, having the muscles isn't, uh, having uh, this whole set of complex muscles isn't the sole explanation for why we are such an expressive species, uh, but these are the, th the uh, elements of our anatomy that make those expressions possible. So let us now come to, to the evolutionary questions. Uh, and the big one is, uh, or the first big one is, what were the major changes that led from fish faces to the human face? And as I mentioned, uh, the first fishes evolved around 500 million years ago, uh, and uh, uh, there's a gr clearly a great deal of difference between this face and this face, uh, even though they are basic faces by the criteria that I've mentioned. Uh, so let us first uh, look at uh, the, uh, the, the general time scale, and then we're going to home in on uh, this period uh, when the first primates arrived. So I've spoken of us as mammals. We are indeed mammals, but we're uh, within one special group of the mammals, the primates. And the distinctive changes that have evolved in our lineage uh, that have made our face what it is uh, all uh, arose in this rel relatively short period. But let's look at the whole um, period in which animals have existed. So first of all, the Earth is estimated to be 4.5 uh, billion years old, and this is a fairly uh, well-agreed figure. Uh, the first animals didn't appear t until only 600 million years ago, so about the last 12% of, of the planet's history. Uh, these first animals were actually very strange and not uh, easily related to um, uh, more contemporary mammals. But uh, the first vertebrates and many of the modern kinds of animals originated here uh, starting about 540 million years ago. The first vertebrates uh, from their fossils date to about 500 million years ago, uh, as I mentioned. The first true mammals, okay, animals that have fur and whose females produce milk for their young, uh, those are the uh, key criteria for making a mammal, uh, arose uh, in the Jurassic period, the age of dinosaurs, uh, uh, maybe uh, 180 to 150 million years ago. The first primates, which are, are our mammalian mother group, uh, arose about 60 million years ago. And we humans arose, uh, our species, uh, arose only 200,000 years ago. So if one were to take this whole 600 million uh, year period for the existence of animals, uh, our species arose, uh, if you were to take that as a 24 hour day, our species arose in the last two minutes. Okay, We are really uh, very recently evolved animals by a lot of, uh, by a, a number of strong criteria. Okay, We can make that statement with uh, reasonable definitiveness. Now, there were human-like uh, species uh, earlier, uh, going back to roughly uh, two million years ago, uh, but that's still only about the last 10 minutes of a, a 24-hour day. Okay. Uh, but what we uh, will want to look at now is how the particular features that make our uh, face special, some of which I enumerated earlier in that quote from Don Enlow, uh, they all arose uh, during, uh, during this 60-year uh, period. And specifically, uh, oh, here, let me backtrack. Uh, let's just uh, look at one uh, early uh, change, which is important. Uh, and, then, uh, we will, and then I'll take you through a quick run through of a lot of evolutionary history, and then we'll start focusing on the primates. So uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first vertebrates uh, arose uh, about 500 million years ago. There were further changes. The big uh, change was the evolution of jaws. Uh, and here I'm not talking about the movie star eating a shark, uh, but uh, the, uh, these uh, elements uh, which allow us to chew our food. Uh, jaws, uh, the evolution of jaws uh, probably only happened only once. It was a, a somewhat unlikely evolutionary event, uh, but it really opened up uh, the capacity of our line of, uh, of animals to, uh, to uh, ingest many different kinds of food. Uh, had we remained jawless uh, fish like this, uh, probably the vertebrates would never have expanded in the way that, uh, that they or we have. Okay, now here is a, quick, a very quick run through of vertebrate history, and, and that will just take us up to the primates, which is what we're uh, interested in, because it's within the primates that our distinctive form of face arose. Uh, so uh, uh, 
about 300 million years ago, uh, there were lobe-finned fish, uh, which uh, were the precursors of the first uh, land-dwelling animals, the amphibians. Uh, the amphibians gave rise to a number of uh, other land-living forms, uh, uh, in particular the branch that gave rise to the dinosaurs, and another branch called the synapsids, uh, which gave rise to, to the mammals. And indeed, these have been called the mammal-like reptiles. Uh, they look very, uh, it, th this is uh, Demetrodon, a, a, f a famous uh, uh, early uh, animal, sometimes mistakenly called a dinosaur. Uh, it was not, it was a synapsid. Uh, and its uh, key feature, which you can't really see here, that made it mammal-like was its different dentition. Uh, there then followed uh, further changes in which these uh, more reptilian-looking animals gave rise to mammals. And finally, there were true mammals. Um, the, the date of, of true mammals, uh, the first dates are a little bit uh, vague depending upon what you define as a true mammal, but let's say about 150 million years ago, uh, whereas the modern forms of mammals um, uh, are more recent than that. And here just to give you uh, a, a century, uh, a, some time sense of, of when mammalian features started arising, uh, this is Demetrodon. Uh, about 290 million years ago. Uh, this is uh, Synognathus, uh, a, ma a mammal-like, uh, an early mammal-like form only 210 million years ago. So about 80 million uh, years, uh, ma mammals cl uh, clearly had their own line of descent. So a lot of this uh, evolution is uh, summarized in this book. This is the first general account of the evolution of the face by a man named William K. Gregory who was a curator at the uh, uh, Museum of Natural History in New York. And uh, this is his classic book, Our Face from Fish to Man. Uh, it was written in the aftermath of the uh, Scopes trial, the, uh, <coughs> the famous trial which, uh, at, which had uh, as, its, as its issue the question of whether evolution should be taught in the schools. Uh, and this is a famous trial involving uh, famous lawyers uh, Charles Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, two major figures in, in American history. So Gregory wrote this book as a defense of, of the existence of evolution, uh, and his take-home message was this. The basic structure of the vertebrate face has stayed much the same, despite many changes in the details, over 400 million years from the early jawed fish to humans. Um, and uh, that uh, is undoubtedly true. Here we have uh, a fish skull. Uh, with the fish face and the rest of the skull. Here is a lion skull. Uh, and even though, of course, at, at one level, uh, these look very different, uh, in their fundamental structure, they're much the same. So uh, along with its basic structure, the vertebrate face has retained its central function from fish to man as sensory headquarters uh, plus the mouth, despite all the changes in details of structure in innumerable species. Okay, so uh, the, the organs of, of smell and uh, taste and vision uh, are much the same in uh, most mammalian faces in their location and their basic function as in some of the uh, early vertebrates which were fish. Okay, so let's uh, now come to the primates, which is our mother group in which the distinctive uh, characteristics of the human face arose. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of, of mammalian evolution. We're just focusing on the primates, one uh, so-called uh, taxonomic order out of uh, 18. Um, and let's, let us look at the, uh, so we are primates, and let us look at the earliest primates uh, from which uh, we arrived. And there are different views. Uh, you know, we're trying to reconstruct things that happened uh, roughly 60 to 65 million years ago. Uh, so there are no living eyewitnesses, uh, so it has to be, it involves a matter of scientific reconstruction. Uh, and uh, there are different views. Uh, so uh, from Robert Martin, who is one of the great experts on primate evolution, we have this view. Uh, uh, from, uh, from another group, we have something closer to, uh, we have uh, a depiction uh, that is an alternative depiction. Uh, in a way, I'm cheating because uh, this is uh, presumed to be the uh, the earliest placental uh, mammal, uh, but the primates arose, uh, almost certainly arose uh, quickly as a separate group from something uh, that might have looked like this, so they might not have looked that different. The important point is that uh, 
whether you accept uh, this view as, as closer to uh, the reality of the earliest primate uh, or this one, uh, these are typical mammalian faces, okay, as, as I showed earlier, um, uh, where uh, there is a projecting snout, uh, there's fur on the face, uh, and, and a few other features. So let us uh, now look at uh, the uh, diversification of the uh, primates and see where the changes came in that helped to make the human face. And this is a uh, picture of the evolutionary or phylogenetic tree of the primates. Uh, and uh, there are two basic groups called the prosimians and the anthropoid primates. And we are uh, definitely a member of the anthropoid primates. And the, uh, the split in these, uh, between these two major branches uh, uh, occurred uh, probably around 55 million, maybe 60 million years ago. Uh, uh, so uh, the ancestral primates, whether they looked like uh, the ones, uh, either of the versions I showed you, uh, were uh, existing at least here, uh, maybe around 63 million years ago, and, and maybe, maybe uh, before. Um, and uh, then they split into the prosimians and the anthropoid primates. And this is where the first major set of changes that led to the human face take, uh, took place. And we'll come to the second set of changes in a moment. But let's look at the first. Uh, so here is a, a prosimian, which despite some exotic details like the rough, uh, uh, looks very much like uh, the, uh, the other mammals that uh, form the majority of mammals. Uh, there is a projecting uh, snout, uh, the eyes are very wide apart, uh, there is fur on the face. Here are two anthropoid primates, and all of the so-called anthropoid primates, uh, and we belong to this large division, uh, anthropoid means man-like, um, uh, have these uh, distinguishing features. They have close-set forward-looking eyes. Notice these eyes are definitely more close-set than these. Uh, we ha uh, the anthropoid primates have a naked or furless face, uh, and they have a reduced muzzle compared to, uh, to the others. So uh, the net result of this first set of physical changes, which probably took place roughly 50 million years ago, is that the anthropoid primate face is far more expressive than the prosimian face. Okay, uh, just by virtue of the face being naked, you can see uh, you can see the skin more clearly in in naked faces than in furred faces, uh, and uh, it is therefore more expressive of feelings, intentions, and simple thoughts. Okay, so this is the first step forward toward uh, human face. And I think we can see that uh, these faces uh, of the anthropoid primates are indeed more human-like than this, which looks more like a, a typical mammal. So uh, if the first major set of changes took place roughly 50 million years ago, uh, uh, changes that led in the direction of the human face, uh, and uh, the second uh, phase of major changes leading to the modern human face uh, including uh, ultimately anatomically modern humans, uh, shown here by this figure, um, took place much later, roughly uh, starting about six, four to six million years ago. Uh, and here I've just uh, sketched it very crudely. Uh, now we don't know what the uh, absolutely ancestral uh, hominin, uh, this, uh, this means the human-like uh, primates uh, look like, but the modern chimpanzee is probably not too far off. There are debates about uh, what the resemblances and differences are, but we can take a modern chimp as a crude representative of uh, uh, the earliest member of the branch that led to humans. And we see some of the changes here. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but I think you can see that this modern human face, which is a bushman from South Africa, uh, really is, is a smaller face than these longer faces of these uh, more ape-like, uh, uh, human-like uh, creatures. Uh, it's a smaller face, it's flat, it's vertical. Uh, there isn't really uh, any sign of a muzzle, uh, okay? Uh, there's a broad forehead, uh, okay. So what were the major changes in the second stage? The complete loss of the muzzle uh, uh, in, in yeah, the complete loss of the muscle, flattening and verticalization of the face. So we really have vertical faces, unlike faces that have projecting snout. The gain of the forehead and behind that our big brain. And I'm now going to concentrate on uh, this uh, because uh, it's uh, quite important. One, it really has changed uh, our look as, as an animal. Uh, and 
secondly, uh, the, the, this is connected to uh, the growth of our big brain, which has certainly been a major uh, um, contributor to the fact that uh, we, uh, we are uh, such a, a facially expressive animal uh, and that those expressions have played a huge part uh, in, our, uh, in our evolution uh, and, and what we are today. Uh, so uh, one of the driving forces uh, or one of the uh, trends in, uh, in our evolution has been the increase in brain size shown here uh, fairly diagrammatically and these are inferred uh, brains uh, because of course the brains themselves haven't been preserved. Uh, what we have is the, uh, the skulls and from the skulls you can uh, reconstruct uh, some of the surface features of, of the brain. Uh, but these are, as I say, somewhat imaginative depictions of uh, the changes in, in brain size uh, that have occurred during, uh, in the course of our uh, developing from the first uh, hominins, uh, the, the first human-like uh, animals, over roughly six million years. So what drove the increase in human brain size? This is really uh, an important and interesting uh, question that's fundamental uh, to uh, understanding human evolution. Uh, the first uh, key point is that uh, something must have, have driven this because brains are expensive, uh, expensive in terms of energy, hence in the amount of nutrients that we have to take in. They comprise only about 2% of body weight, which doesn't sound like a, a large percentage, but it's a relatively large amount for an animal but they require 20% of the energy needed by the body. Okay, so brains are energetically expensive and that makes demands on the animal uh, for adequate nutrition, okay? So there are three general explanations. I'm gonna run through them fairly quickly uh, and not do any of them real justice, uh, but just to sketch them out. There's the better nutrition hypothesis, uh, the need for greater intelligence for foraging and hunting, and finally, uh, the, the third uh, hypothesis is that it was the growing array of social interactions, this, uh, something known as the social brain hypothesis, that drove the increase in brain size. So the better nutrition hypothesis, uh, there are several variants of this. Uh, I think uh, one of the favorite ones comes from Richard Wrangham, who's a professor at Harvard and a friend and colleague of mine. Uh, and uh, essentially it is that uh, when humans learned how to cook, uh, they were able to increase uh, the uh, efficiency with which they extracted uh, calories from food. And there's a lot of evidence for this, but it's not clear to me that uh, simply uh, having more uh, easier access to more energy would have driven the increase in brain size. Uh, I think the, uh, a more plausible explanation is that uh, there were pressures uh, for uh, increased complexity of behaviors uh, and, and, and various brain-related functions, which required better nutrition, uh, but the better nutrition uh, itself, which uh, he has emphasized comes from cooking, and cooking definitely releases more uh, readily available energy. Uh, uh, I think that simply the available availability of more energy by cooking food probably does not explain uh, uh, the increase in brain size. And there, there are other uh, variants of this hypothesis, but they all uh, emphasize uh, increased um, energy availability from foods as the driving force. So I, th I think uh, that uh, this is unlikely. Uh, I would say it's an insufficient uh, reason to explain the increase in brain size. What about the need for greater intelligence for foraging and hunting? There's no question that uh, foraging and hunting that as humans do it is uh, often a more sophisticated, even often a much more sophisticated way of getting food than the way uh, most of our uh, brother animals uh, get their food, uh, including our, our uh, nearest uh, relatives amongst the primates. So I think that uh, for various reasons, which uh, I'm not going to detail here, I think that this is uh, unconvincing as the prime driver of uh, what uh, has made our brains bigger uh, the, this is unconvincing as the major selective force uh, for larger brains. What about the third one, the growing array of social interactions, the social brain hypothesis? Uh, there isn't time to go into all of this, but there is a great deal of support for it, that it was the growing complexity of social interactions, uh, whether uh, in, in raising offspring, in interacting with each other, uh, that uh, may have been the driving force in, in driving uh, brain growth. Uh, 
So, uh, in my opinion, this is the best. Uh, and it's uh, inextricably bound up with the idea of social selection, um, uh, namely the idea that social interaction strengthens social cohesion, which promotes the survival of the group and thereby of its individual members. And here I've allowed myself to give one reference. Uh, this, is, uh, this idea has, I think, not really been given enough play, but this idea was first explained uh, by a guy named Herbert Simon, who is an economist, not a biologist, but somebody with a very great range. Um, and uh, the idea simply is that in, uh, we are necessarily a cooperative species. Certainly in our early days, we needed a lot of cooperation to get things done. You take a human and put him or her out on his or her own, uh, and uh, that person's uh, survival will be rapidly compromised. Uh, we are inherently a social animal and we need our social um, cohesion in order to, uh, to survive. Uh, I realize that I'm not uh, giving this argument in as full detail as it merits, but that's just because of time. But I would recommend, if anybody's interested in following it up, looking at this uh, article by Herbert Simon. Now, three key points about social selection. It's not the same as group selection. Uh, group selection posits that certain things evolved because they were for the good of the group. Uh, instead, the idea of social selection posits that there were strengthened social bonds that were of direct benefit to the individual, often at minimal cost. Okay, um, again, that deserves more explanation than I can give it here, but that is uh, a key idea. For humans, the evolution of social interactions must have been to some degree coupled with the evolution of language. Okay, it's hard to uh, convey uh, your wish to do things cooperatively uh, without language. You can do it to some extent, and animals do, but language uh, has almost uh, un undoubtedly been of crucial importance in our evolution as a species. Finally, the evolution of language was almost certainly tied up with both the evolution of the brain and of facial expressions accompanying speech. But, fa uh, but faces, so uh, in, that, in that last point, uh, we come back to, to the face, uh, that uh, facial expressions uh, are in speech, uh, in a sense, a fundamental part of what we communicate by speech. And if you think about your own reactions with people, uh, you will understand that that's true. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, every uh, prolonged dialogue between people involves a play of facial expressions as well as the words that are conveyed. And that's why it's often much more effective to talk uh, with someone about something that's difficult face to face than by email, for example. Okay. But faces convey uh, much information about an individual in addition to that about mood and feelings. Faces provide information, uh, visual information about gender, okay, age. Um, admittedly, I've ch chosen those examples to maximize the contrast. Uh, there would also be a size difference between these two people. But even just from the photographs, you know that uh, you're looking at a baby here, uh, a, young, a very young person, and an older person there. Uh, ethnicity. As, as an example, and character. Uh, now this is the most tricky and perhaps the most ambiguous. Uh, so to weight the scales, I've contrasted uh, Abraham Lincoln with Rasputin. Uh, <laughs> but, and uh, there are some wonderful pictures of Rasputin in which his eyes look positively crazy. Um, but I think even if you didn't know anything about the history, of the, uh, the, you know, the historical importance of these people, and, uh, these two uh, individuals and what they were like, I think that if you saw lots of pictures of, of Lincoln and of this man, uh, you would uh, conclude that this man was indeed more trustable. Uh, it really comes through in, in his uh, facial expressions and the set of his face. Okay, um, so uh, the face provides a tremendous amount of information to our fellows, uh, often just at a glance, and these are an important part of our social interactions. So. Uh, Faces provide an instant visual identification of a particular individual. In effect, of the 7.3 billion people on Earth today, there are about that many distinguishable faces. Of course, identical twins and triplets uh, are an exception, but uh, indeed, uh, m most human faces are at least slightly different from other, other faces and often very different. Uh, so, and rapid visual identification is an invaluable aid in social interactions, and this is just an obvious point when you walk into a room, uh, you look for people you know, you do it almost immediately from their face. Yes, there may be hints about from their size or body build and so on, but, but the face is the main provider of information about uh, who, you're, who you're looking for. 
So is there an evolutionary explanation for facial differences? Yes. If, individual dif if facial differences provide quick individual identification, and if that identification promotes social interactions, most of which are positive, uh, helpful, then there will be selection for that, such differences. Uh, now, uh, there is actually beginning to be a genetics of facial difference. Uh, I'm going to just go over this very lightly because I think it gets into too much detail for the time I have allowed. I'm not even sure if I've exceeded uh, that time. Um, so I'm just going to leave this with you as a specific point, that it's now possible to identify specific genetic differences as correlated with individual um, uh, specific facial differences. There's beginning to be a, gen a true genetics of facial difference. There are at least, at this point, uh, 20 genes that are identified with specific facial differences. Uh, and at some point, just from uh, uh, sequence uh, genomes alone and the genes that are involved in, in creating facial differences, one may be able to actually reconstruct what the faces uh, look like from the genetic differences. This is really, it's still for the future, but it's within the realm of possibility now. So uh, with those findings, can facial be differences be related to social selection? Uh, namely a selection for, uh, for um, uh, individuals within a particular social context. context. Almost certainly, uh, new work shows that quantitatively faces are indeed more morphologically diverse than other regions of the body. Okay? Uh, so our faces show more differences than any other part of our body. The genes implicated in generating facial differences are under selection to be different. The phenomenon of negative frequency dependent selection, or NFDS, uh, we can, this is an awkward term and we can forget it, but the important point is that it seems that there actually is selection for us to have different faces so that we can recognize each other very quickly. And this only makes sense in terms of uh, uh, facial difference actually promoting uh, uh, interactions uh, that are ultimately uh, helpful. Uh, this, this point could be elaborated a lot and it's interesting, but there isn't time. So let, I'm now uh, coming to, to the close of the lecture and just summing up. So what was the major net effect of the changes that led from fish faces to the human face? So let's first just look at fish faces. Uh, and it's not just fish faces, but the faces are shown by fish, amphibia, reptiles, and birds, the, uh, the four major classes apart from the mammals amongst the vertebrates, the animals with backbones. So uh, uh, these faces were indeed the sensory headquarters of the animal and the site of food ingestion in the mouth. Uh, Primarily, the face uh, existed as a receiver of information about the world uh, and initially for the animal to find food. Now, with the mammals, uh, there began to be real facial expressions and hence information to other members of the, of the same species about what was going on in the mind of, of the animal making these expressions. So uh, there were the same functions as found in the other kinds of vertebrates. Uh, plus the face was a provider of some information to others. And with us, uh, in the genus Homo, and specifically our own species, uh, Homo sapiens, there were all the same original functions of the face, okay, for locating food and so on, plus it was a provider, the face has become a provider of huge amounts of information about the individual, and this is of social value. Uh, the face is a storehouse and transmitter of information, okay, so the face, uh, the earliest vertebrate faces were primarily receivers, uh, or, sorry, were primarily uh, receivers of information about the world uh, and of course as a site of ingestion for food. Our face is uh, certainly uh, a storehouse of information about the face, uh, but it also uh, conveys that information to the fellow members of our species. It's a, f a fairly fundamental difference and of course as I've stressed, uh, this is shared with our nearest relatives, uh, but also to some extent with more, more distant mammalian relatives. But we've taken it to an extreme. So summing up, I'll just read this out. For about 450 million years of evolutionary history, the faces of vertebrates functioned primarily as the sensory headquarters of the individual. Okay? The concentrated area in which three of the main five sense, uh, senses are uh, lo localized. Uh, initially and particularly in the search for ingestion of food. Furthermore, a point that I haven't really elaborated, but I'll say, state it here. Matters of diet influence the shape of jaws and teeth and the placement of the sensory apparatus and therefore the shape and structure of the face.
Okay, so matters of diet were really crucial in uh, shaping the evolution of the face uh, for most of uh, vertebrate history. For 50 or so million years, in the anthropoid primates specifically, the social environment played an increasing role, uh, becoming even stronger and more complex in the hominins, uh, the hominins being uh, uh, our group. Thus, social selection has played a major part in shaping the human face in all its unusualness. We are the most sociable of animals, and the physical characteristics of the human face reflect a long history of increasingly complex social interactions. But now I'd like to, and that is, in a sense is the main message from this talk, but I'd like to end uh, with a, an additional thought uh, and even a bit of advice, uh, and that is that uh, uh, our, uh, the capacity of our face uh, to, uh, to give out information is incredibly valuable and unusual, uh, and uh, more than 50 million years of anthropoid primate evolution have been invested in a sense, not, not by anybody deliberately making it so, it just happened, have been uh, 50 million years of primate evolution have invested in making our faces superb instruments for communicating our thoughts and feelings. I urge you to take advantage of that uh, as much as possible. If you want to communicate something important and or complex to someone, do it face to face, not by email. At least by <laughs> Skype, okay? <laughs> um, and. Uh, um, I think with that, I'll close. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes? Can you explain exactly how the genetic selection is different from other people can work if we inherit our facial characteristics from Yeah, uh, so I think you're asking me what is uh, negative frequency dependent selection. Um, it, it, well, this is the awkward, this is the awkward term. Uh, uh, how can there be uh, selection for, for difference? Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it depends on, uh, I think it, in this case certainly, it depends on uh, people perceiving difference and finding it attractive. Uh, so we, we all know that, uh, so uh, it comes into probably uh, what's termed sexual selection, uh, where uh, there is a uh, a special set of, of things that influence uh, uh, the uh, selection of characteristics that have to do with mating, uh, whom you want to uh, link up with. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's almost uh, certainly something that has been, uh, in, I, I think it's, it's almost certain that uh, this uh, preference for slight difference is connected with, uh, with what we find attractive uh, in others. Um, uh, this, this point hasn't yet has not received a lot of attention. Uh, uh, the, the main findings that uh, really support this idea came out only a year or two ago uh, from a, a guy named Michael O'Shean, who's, uh, oh, yeah, O'Shean, uh, who's um, a professor at Cornell University. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's all I can say about it. But basically it comes down to the fact that people like a degree of difference when, when selecting their mates. And this um, has the side effect uh, of, uh, of, of helping to make us all different, which has the, uh, the important value, uh, additional value uh, that uh, uh, in social interactions uh, we, are, uh, in, uh, we can identify each other much more readily. Uh, without without uh, this negative uh, frequency dependent selection, uh, we, we might uh, be tending to be more homogeneous. There would be less facial difference uh, and more similarity over time. Uh, but here we are uh, standing at 7.3 billion people on Earth with nearly that many uh, different and discernibly different faces. And it's because it must have something to do with the fact that uh, difference uh, in our prospective mates, uh, slight facial differences, uh, often are attractive. I'm not sure I can say anything more about it than that, but that's the rough idea. Yes. Oh, oh sorry. Yes. Yeah. 
symmetry and it had a scarf that showed his um, other actors had like this sort of perfect face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So this idea is well believed and there's a lot of uh, supporting evidence for it uh, that uh, uh, symmetrical faces, really uh, highly symmetrical faces are more attractive to members of the opposite sex than more visibly asymmetric faces. Um, so uh, there, there is uh, a fair amount of scientific data supporting this. Um, I'm, not sure I, I, I'm not sure I'm equipped to say anything more than that, but that, uh, that comes into it. Uh, does that help answer your, your question? Or? I was just sort of pointing out that it was a slightly different take on It's a slightly different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the idea in general is that uh, more symmetric uh, faces indicate um, kind of a better construction of, of the person as a whole. And uh, I think we all know that we find uh, more symmetrical faces inherently more attractive than more visibly asymmetric ones. And that uh, must affect uh, the likelihood with which one can mate with, with others. Uh, yeah. Yes? Did I hear you uh, say, did I correctly hear you say that thought processes help to shape the brain? And if so, how do they do that? Um, well, I'm not sure I said exactly that, but thought processes certainly affect our behavior, uh, and our behaviors then uh, our in the sense of animals, uh, an animal's behavior uh, will affect uh, how well it uh, survives, uh, and uh, hence, uh, you know, whether it's likely to have more progeny or not. Um, do, does that uh, help does answer? Does actually affect the physical structure? So it's, it's indirect, okay? So there's a selection for, uh, for um, neural uh, superstructure that, uh, per, that uh, permits or promotes certain kinds of behaviors, which in turn are either more favorable or less uh, for uh, promoting the survival of the animal. So it's an indirect uh, way of uh, affecting the likelihood of uh, selection for, animal, for an animal with those properties. Yes? Yes. Individuals. Yes. And so um, it seems to me, listening to your discussion, that we only need to distinguish about 100 different uh, facial uh, uh, arrangements, something like that, according to the evolutionary uh, analysis. And so in the modern world where you're living in cities of millions, you have to have social evolution to contribute to the distinctiveness of all the individuals. And I and my, my thinking as you're talking is that you've also explained the evolution of all kinds of social phenomena like fashion, for instance. I don't know what you're Yes, uh, so uh, we are used to, uh, to a world of cities and towns and large numbers of, of people. Um, uh, most of the, uh, of the evolution I've discussed occurred when, uh, there were, uh, when groups of humans were, were much uh, smaller. Um, but uh, there is undoubtedly uh, evolutionary selection going on uh, today in uh, these very large mixed groups. I mean, uh, what we have today is really unprecedented in the evolution of uh, our species or indeed any uh, species, this going from uh, small interactive groups to potentially huge ones. Um, so uh, I'm, does, does that uh, pertain to, to what you're, you're saying? I'm, I'm, I'm you can yeah, judge it from your facial features. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. Please join me to thank today's speaker again. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.